I was a child who was very sociable, very active, um, very confident young boy. I was concentrating in class. I liked sports when I was growing up. I liked hanging out in the park when I was growing up, going out on my bike and meet my friends. And I never told anybody about what was going on. I grew up in a place called Crawley in London and on a normal estate in a normal neighbourhood. Um, I went to a public school, primary school. Up until I was eight years old, I was just living as a child. I wasn't thinking about the future. You're just living in the moment, aren't you, at that age? So I was an energetic child with lots of friends and doing well at school and excelling in sports. And my home life was good. Um, there was nothing out of the ordinary about anything that was going on with my life. There was a man who would come around the house, a trusted member of the family. He would come to parties and gatherings and he was a trusted member of society also. I believe the more he spent time with me, the more he took a liking to me. I remember there was a girl group out at the time called TLC and they had the song called No Scrubs and I believe that that was their album. And I wanted it so bad, but there was just no way of me getting hold of it. But I remember that he actually bought me that CD and when he gave it to me, I just remember feeling really happy. I mean, how do you feel when somebody buys you a present at that age that you usually couldn't get? I mean, you're just over the moon. And I just felt really connected with him in that, at that stage. Now, just for context, he was 25 years old. So it's not like he was an old man. He was an older boy in my eyes that I kind of looked up to. I thought he was cool. So anything that he was telling me, I was trying to do. Looking back at it now, of course, I can see that he was befriending me. Um, he was making sure that I thought he was my friend and we were best friends. So it was just a good technique for him to kind of hook me in. And we've always just got to remember that your memories from ages, those ages are so, so small compared to like the things that you remember and in the detail that you remember now. But I just cannot tell you like any kind of timeline whatsoever. All I know is we've got the TLC album as a, as a moment. We've got playing Sonic the Hedgehog 2 as, an, as a moment on the Mega Drive. We've got playing football as a moment. And that's where it starts to become really confusing from my side and very frustrating because I can't tell you the order. And also it then starts to become very difficult to talk about because if you're talking about this for the first time and you're very unsure about actually all the sequence of events and you're worried about possibly reporting to the police or telling somebody for the first time and you feel unsure yourself, it then is, gives you a lack of confidence to ever say anything. All I know is that I have a reference of eight years old from where we were living and I know that I have a reference of when he moved away. So the sexual abuse that was going on with me and this man, I've got a series of video snippets of that in my head that I can remember so vividly in detail. Maybe because they're so horrific. It was kissing, touching, fondling, oral, and everything but se actual sexual intercourse. It can often be thought like, how do you even arrive at that situation? Or how, do you, how does that situation even continue? Because everybody thinks that sexual abuse on a child is always violent. I believe it's very rarely violent. He was very comforting. It's almost like he was very loving, touching me gently, hugging me, kissing me. I mean, kissing is a very gentle and loving action. A child at eight years old doesn't know that, that kissing an adult is something that you shouldn't be doing, especially when you've been tricked into doing it with that person and that person's told you that it must be a secret and it's our secret and then we can keep it. So I had no alarm bells ringing at all. And none of what we were doing was violent. None of what we were doing was painful. So there was no reason for me to tell anybody. Now what we must remember is it was 1993 when this was going on. So there wasn't even internet at that time. There was no talk of sex. Uh, you know, an eight year old would have never come across anything really sexual. And for sure at schools they weren't talking about it. So there was no reason for me to tell anybody about what was going on. 
And of course, we were, I was greatly manipulated and, and programmed into not saying anything as well. Like, if, if we really want to talk about this seriously, when he performed oral sex on me, it felt warm. It felt tingly. It felt, it was, a, it gave my body physical nice sensations. Like I was a, hu I'm a human being, you know? It gives you a physical response. You can't get away from that. It's the genitals. So all of these things are so confusing and manipulating and programming when it comes to like the actual act of sexual abuse. There was a couple of uncomfortable moments and I remember them so well. And it was when it was my turn to do things to him. Now, for example, the oral sex. For me to do that to him, it tastes disgusting. It was horrible. It made me feel uncomfortable, but I just knew he liked it. So I'd just get on with it, you know? It, it was my, he was my friend, and I just thought this was what, what our friendship meant. So I'd just continue doing it, and then it would just be over in a moment. When you look back at who I was at that time, I did feel obligated to get involved in this. I did feel like this was our secret. We were friends and this is what we do and we mustn't tell anybody. I mean, how many children have playground secrets? Children aren't telling you everything that happened in the playground that day, right? And when you ask them, how was school? They will say, oh, I don't want to talk about it or I can't remember. It's like children keep secrets and when they're told to keep a secret, they will keep a secret. Um, and when you've got no tools or knowledge to recognise those alarm bells or those uncomfortable moments that it gave me, then, you know, he had me, he had me wrapped around his little finger. So when the abuse finished, which was when I was 10 years old, I just continued as the child that I was before. Doing well at school, done well at college, got a good career. I was out partying at the weekends, living a nice life. Few things here and there would remind me of the abuse, like something would come up on the TV or somebody would say something. It was always in the back of my mind, but it just wasn't bothering me. It would unsettle me for a moment, but then I'd just return back to normal because things were going well. Everything changed when I was in my mid-twenties. And that's when I started having low bouts of sadness and I couldn't quite work out why they were there because that wasn't my usual character. And then as time went on, the bouts of sadness got deeper and they just kind of grew in magnitude. And after two years of this, I thought, ah, we've got a problem here because I think it's that abuse that's coming back now. Having sex enter your childhood prematurely is affecting the brain. It's rewiring it in some way. I heard a psychologist say that when a child goes through something that they could never process at that time, what they do is they cleverly box it up and put it to the back of their mind and just store it there until they're of development or of maturity to deal with it. And when they get to that age, your mind cleverly brings the box back to the front of your mind and just opens it and just lets you, lets you start to deal with the situation because you eventually have to deal with it. And I believe in my mid twenties, that was what was happening. By this point I was 27 and the abuse finished when I was 10, so 17 years afterwards. And I'm like, for 17 years, this has not bothered me. And so I was annoyed that this had come back. Now my technique or my strategy was, well, if I just bat it away, it's eventually gonna dissolve and disappear. I mean, what 27 year old man wants to start talking about another man that sexually abused him when he was a child? Nobody wants to talk about that. So I tried my hardest to ignore it. The thoughts would come and I'd ignore them. The thoughts would come stronger and I'd ignore them. But after two years of doing this, I realized that I wasn't getting anywhere with it. And that is when, and, and really, I don't know why I thought this would be a good idea, but that's when I thought, you should tell somebody because this whole ignoring it is not working. I, I, I'm not sure why I came to the conclusion that telling somebody was a good idea, but thank goodness. I did. I'm very lucky to have a close group of friends that I trusted to tell. That is a very important point that I like to make. Because after I'd thought hard about what had happened for the two years and realized that what I needed to do was speak to somebody about it, I started to gear myself up to do that. And I'd be in the pub with friends and I'd be like, I'm gonna do it now. 
just do it, just do it, just do it. But then I just, I literally could not get the words out. I'd go home and I'd be like, ah, oh, you just really should have done it. It would have been fine. The next opportunity, you've got to do it. And I'd be sitting around with friends and I'd be like, right, just say it now, just say it now, just say it. It's almost like a physical block in my body that wouldn't allow me to say it. But then the third time I went for it, I was drinking, I was with, with my friend, and I just remember saying to him, mate, you are never gonna believe what happened to me when I was younger. And when I actually told him, he could not believe it. I will always be very grateful to him because without him realizing, he gave me the perfect response, which was, of course, he believed me. He was sad for me. He was angry for me. He was frustrated for me. He gave me every emotion, which is what I needed. And we talked about it. You know, I told him about what went on and he just was like wondering why he didn't notice. He was wondering why he didn't ask the right questions, but of course, I mean, he was never to know. Nobody was ever to know. And I woke up the next morning, it was like a weight has been shifted off my shoulders. It was like an incredible feeling of release, but also very interestingly, a very intense feeling of confidence. I felt like, wow, you can actually talk about this without any problems and people aren't going to laugh at you. People aren't going to think any worse of you or think that you're lower in some way. They're actually just going to have um, empathy for what you're saying. And I started to think, well, why don't you tell another person? So I then told another person and then maybe some months later I told another friend. And I kept doing this month on month until I told my close circle of friends. And the way I was talking about it started to change because I started to talk about it with like a lot more confidence. I started branching out to my outer circle. Maybe I'd tell my friend's partners or I'd tell my friend's parents. That's when things really started to evolve because I started to understand that there's such power in these stories. No shame, no embarrassment. I feel like when you speak about anybody that abused you in any way, there is an intense feel of threat in your mind, as if there's still a threat to you. We need to remind ourselves that we're adults now and that situation has no threat to us. That's something that I learned through this journey of, of speaking out. So the more I started thinking about the sexual abuse that I went through as a child, the more I started to think about the man that did this to me. Where was he now? And was he doing it to more children? That was the important point. And I felt some almost responsibility to find out because how can I live knowing that there's a man out there with a tendency towards children and I haven't done anything about it? So I started searching for him online. Now I had his name and I came across his Facebook profile and there he was in his pictures. Now my heart's racing as I see him for the first time for 25 years. And I say to myself, just look at him. It's almost like I needed just to face that fear. Now I messaged him saying to him, you need to meet me. We need to talk about what happened 25 years ago. And I said to him that if you don't contact me, I'm gonna have to go to the police. I press send, I go and do my thing. I go back on my Facebook two hours later and he's blocked me. So I decide to go and report him to the police. The police were very supportive in the way they handled the situation. I went in to give my statement. It was a three hour statement where I detailed everything, the taste, the touch, the feel of him. It was the most explicit level that I'd ever talked about the sexual abuse previously. Now, usually they have an officer questioning and they have an officer also, another officer, to support my well-being, but they don't have enough money anymore for the second officer. So that just gives you an idea of how underfunded this, these situations are. They take my statement and they begin investigating. They put him on voluntary arrest, which allows him to come to the station himself, which is always going to be a mistake because that gave him the opportunity to wipe his computer clean if, the, if he needed to and they interviewed him. Of course, he denied it. They also interviewed all of my friends that I'd ever told. And now we come to a big problem. The police are continuing the investigation and they're asking me more questions. 
How often was he at the house? How was he even arriving at the house? And these are all questions that I didn't have any answers to. And the only people that have answers to that are my parents. And I always wanted my parents to go to their grave never finding out about what happened. But the fact that they had to be interviewed by the police meant that I had to tell them. And I will never forget their face the day that I told them. It has literally ripped their lives apart and they will never ever recover from this because they're parents and they will feel and always feel that they failed to do their duty of keeping me safe. So that has torn their whole existence apart and I wouldn't be surprised if they wake up every morning thinking about this and going to bed every morning thinking about this blaming themselves. Now the police investigation lasted for nine months and eventually was closed because the police force can only take the strongest cases that year to court and mine wasn't strong enough to make the cut. This was done in 1993. There wasn't a text message, there wasn't an email, there was none of that. Unfortunately, there's just not enough money to take every case to court. So my case didn't make court and they closed the case. So I have to swallow the fact that that man did something, he denied it, and he's still out there, most probably, statistics show us, doing this to more children, and that is a big problem. Because who knows what would have happened if we could have got that man in the dock. He probably would have crumbled under the pressure. I always want to make the point that throughout my prosecution attempt against the man that abused me when I was a child, the police were extremely supportive. But they are limited in what they can do due to funding. And the fact that my case got closed and we couldn't get a prosecution and take this to court is because of a lack of money. It's not that because of a lack of effort of the police and I always want to make that point clear. Once the police investigation had been called off and I appealed it and was told that there was nothing that could be done. But I just couldn't shift the anger. He had denied it. How dare he deny it? So I decided that I wanted to face him and actually the only way that I could face him was to find out where he lived and go and knock on his door, confront him on what he did and tell him that if he's still doing it to other children then he must stop. Now I didn't want to do this because I felt like it had one foot in like the criminal area and I wasn't sure what even the outcome would be, how it was gonna go, but I knew that it was something that I needed to do. When I packed my car up, knowing where he lived, the thought of knocking on his door made my heart race. I approached the door, I knocked, and he answered. Now he recognized me instantly, went to slam the door shut, but I managed to hold it open with my foot, and I told him everything that I ever wanted to tell him. Now what he actually did was call the police. I'd finished my piece and I said to him, where are the police? And he said that they're coming. So I said, I'll wait at the top of the drive. The police arrived and they came up to me and they said, can you tell me what you're doing here? I pointed to him as he was peeking through the door. And I said, that's the man that was sexually abusing me when I was a child and I've come to speak to him about it. And they were like, oh. They could see that I wasn't there to cause any trouble or violence. I was arrested because the man that abused me decided to prosecute me, press charges against me. And he was pressing charges against me for stalking, harassment and assault. I had to go to court three times. I pleaded not guilty and they actually found me guilty for the assault and they gave me a caution for the stalking and harassment. I was told by my barrister that they cannot be seen to be allowing people going and knocking on people's door and they have to caution you and prosecute you for something and that situation is now over. I will not pursue him anymore, I've done everything that I can. But there is still the big problem because people often say, oh now you can put it behind you, now that you have closure and I, I, it just confuses me that we even have that viewpoint because the big problem is there's still a man out there that we know has got a tendency towards children. No one's monitoring his whereabouts, what job he does, what he's doing online. And that is where the big problem is. And that's when it starts to become bigger than my story. Everything I learned on this journey showed me that there is so much strength in stories. And actually when I started speaking out loud about what happened, just give me such a great release and a confidence with what happened and help me deal with it. So I wanted to give that same opportunity to others that wanted to share if they wish to do so. 
So I launched a new platform online called Something to Say. And that's where we started to share other people's stories and people started to express what happened to them when they were children. And this thing just started to gain momentum. And we started to evolve it into different areas and now it's just really become a thing. Something that I'm really trying to push here is the awareness, getting people to understand that this doesn't happen in certain communities, or certain social circles. This is actually creeped into all communities and all societies and it's something that we really need to work hard at changing, changing the perception of it, changing the importance of it, changing the priority of it. Now I believe that there are some key areas to doing this. Number one is to show people and allow people to speak their story with strength and courage and to let them know that we will not hold them to any shame or embarrassment and just to show people that that can be done if they wish to do so. The next one is education. Let's just get the young people educated on the simple things like where the private areas are on their body and what to do if anybody goes near them. There are just simple pieces of education along with the stranger danger conversation and say no to drugs conversation. These are all in the same part. Let's get the young people, give them the tools and the knowledge to understand if something's happening to them and that they can tell us. I often ask the question, is paedophilia something that somebody's born with or something that somebody learns as their life goes on? I don't know what the answer is, but what I know is it is preventable. How are we going to catch them or help them not do it for the first time. Because guaranteed once they've done it once, they'll continue doing it for the rest of their lives. And it's all about prevention here. We need to be working towards prevention. And that's what a lot of the movement is about. We're receiving messages every day from people saying that the platform has given them strength and courage to speak out themselves, in particular men, because men don't see other men speak out very often. So to come to this platform, something to say and see how, how much strength and courage there is around this. I'm also getting lots of messages from parents saying that we've opened their eyes to opening conversations with their children in their family, just on the simple rules of private areas, what to do if anybody approaches them that they don't know online, etc. These are all incredible moves forward. I wanna get as creative as I can in communicating this topic in a way that people become interested in it. They're curious to know more. They're curious to learn more because at the moment, people turn away from it. Nobody wants to be scrolling on their social media. They just scroll past it. I don't want it to be like that. I want it to be like, oh my God, that's really difficult to watch, but that's so interesting. I've learned so much. I want to really turn this on its head using film, animation, and photography. There needs to be more support services for victims to help them manage the memories of their past. There needs to be more support services for people who are offending, who are trying to not offend. There needs to be somewhere for them to go. There needs to be more funding for the prosecution system so that we can actually get these people prosecuted, get them monitored for the rest of their lives, just to ensure that they're not gonna keep reoffending. I believe child sexual abuse is completely preventable and we must make a change and we must not stop until we get it.